Uh, then, of course, we have intrinsic lung lesions uh, where we have CPAMs or congenital pulmonary airway malformation. We have bronchopulmonary sequestration uh, and we have hybrid lesions. And very often, it becomes difficult to differentiate one from the other. Now, overall, if you look at ecogenic and uh, cystic masses, the incidence is about 1 in 3,000. Now, CPAM uh, typically is actually, uh, they feel, feel it's an hematoma, it's a mesenchymal sort of uh, uh, changes coming up within the lung. Uh, usually it is unilateral, but it can affect either any lobe or, an, uh, or the entire lung or multiple lobes as we see subsequently. So it's one of the most common congenital lung lesions, almost 75% of all lung lesions and it is a hematomatous lesion supposed to be. And the pathology basically is that uh, there is an overgrowth of mesenchymal tissue because of cessation of the bronchial growth at a very early stage with uh, an insert happening before 16 or 17 weeks of gestation. And one of the hallmarks of CPAM is that there's a communication with the proximal airways, uh, though of course this communication may be abnormal. And of course, the, uh, the diagnostic feature of a CPAM is that the blood flow for CPAM comes from the pulmonary artery and the venous drainage also is from the pulmonary veins. So whenever we see masses like this, here for example, it's a, a filling up entire, uh, entire one of the lung and it's very important to look at the blood flow. Now this is an old classification uh, which was based on histopathology. A lot of people have given it up. But overall, I still feel that it's a good way of describing these lesions. It's a good way of prognosticating lesions and therefore you can still use it. So typically type 1 is multiple large cysts, uh, usually more than 5 centimeters. Type 2 are multiple small cysts, less than 5. And type 3 are micro cysts or they are uh, uh, solid cystic lesions, typically less than 5 millimeters. So that's an example of a type 1 uh, CPAM, type 2 CPAM, and that's an example of a type 3 CPAM. So a lot of people don't believe in this classification, but I still feel that it's a good way of describing this lesion. So type 3 are usually solid, uniform decogenic, or they can be very, very tiny micro cysts. Now compared to CPAMs, the other pathology which we see is pulmonary sequestration. Now here typically uh, the lesions could be small. Uh, they are very often close to the diaphragm. They are very often sort of uh, triangular in shape. And the diagnostic thing is of course a blood flow coming from a systemic vessel like the aorta. So these are solid econionic lesions. They are thought to be of a pleural origin. And the difference is that there is no communication with the bronchial tree. And here again we can we have a large uh, sort of sequestration. But the and, the and the blood flow is coming from the aorta. So uh, very often, as I said, they are uh, located very close to the diaphragm. They could be infradiaphragmatic also. Most of the time, they are unilateral. They could be bilateral. And the uh, uh, blood flow is very, very important. And of course, very often what we have are hybrid lesions where we have a component of sequestration and CPAM coming together and actually on ultrasound it is very difficult to differentiate between the different types of lesions very often. Now, um, so we very often uh, we see them as supradiaphragmatic, infradiaphragmatic but and just so we had one case uh, where uh, antenatally we felt it is supradiaphragmatic, postnatally when the baby was born, uh, uh, on scanning we felt it is infradiaphragmatic but on surgery actually it turned out to be intradiaphragmatic sequestration, which is a very, very rare thing to happen. So look out, so it's a very important thing here is to look out for the blood flow, whether it's coming from the pulmonary vessels or whether it is coming from the aorta. And nowadays, of course, with good machines, that is very easy to do. So with sequestration, we can have other anomalies like diaphragmatic hernia, vertebral anomalies, uh, congenital diseases, uh, pulmonary hypoplasia, of course, colonic duplication, etc. And therefore, a thorough search is very uh, often required. So as I said, that very often, almost sometimes 50% of these lesions could be hybrid and it is very difficult to differentiate between this time. So typically, most of these lesions, they increase till about 24 weeks or 26 weeks. They, they reach a peak around that time and then gradually decrease. Uh, that's, that's very important. And all of them do that and therefore, very often, the composition is not a very, very important issue. So we all know that uh, what we look out for whenever there is CPAM or pelvic sequestration is the presence of hydrops. So once you see hydrops, uh, then of course, 
uh, we uh, we are worried about the uh, about the uh, outcome. And typically, when you see progressive eye drops coming up in the second trimester, then of course the prognosis may be bad. Or in some cases, once there is an eye drops, or uh, then we should or may think of doing an intervention as well. So when you counsel the patient, this is very important in CPAM. There is no significant association with chromosomal abnormal genetic syndrome, so it's reassuring. And uh, less than 20% uh, develop high drops. So CPAM, no high drops, very good survival rate, and almost 50% resolve. Antenatally, with high drops, the mortality goes up significantly to 90 to 95%, and some of them we might have to intervene in utero. So just some examples. Uh, this year, 20, uh, uh, 2020, we had this lady who, had, uh, uh, who came on 1st October, that was a, a smallish sort of a CPAM. We followed up, she came from a long distance and she came directly in December and the entire lesion has totally disappeared. This is another lady, uh, she had a very large lesion. In fact, it was occupying the entire lung and someone uh, somehow suggested a termination and she came to us. Uh, it looked like a hybrid lesion. There was some uh, blood flow coming from the aorta. So we reassured her and we said, okay, we'll follow it up. There were no signs of eye drops. There was no eye terminus. And uh, we followed it up. Subsequently, it went on reducing in size. Uh, and uh, I thought I must say totally disappeared. The child was born. We did a CT scan after that. And there was no lesion. The child was asymptomatic. So uh, uh, now uh, some measurements uh, we do very often in practice. There are newer measurements which have also come up. But this is a good way of uh, sort of prognosticating. So what we do is we do the CPAN volume and then uh, we take a ratio with the head circumference and we come and uh, we derive what is known as a CVR. And again, these are very easily available on the net, uh, these calculators. So if the CVR, of course, is low, it's a good thing. If it is large, more than 1.6, then we need to keep a closer watch. So if you have a CVR of more than 1.6 and you see large cysts in the, in the malformation, this is, these are the feta who require a very close follow-up and uh, subsequently may uh, potentially develop high drops or you might have to intervene. So typically that's a figure which is good enough for counseling. Some people like to take volume of the lung and compare it with the weight and this is also uh, can be done. So what we are worried about in CPAN and large propelling sequestration is the development of high drops uh, with uh, ascites coming up. So, uh, most of the uh, literature says that even if you have a mediastinal shift, that doesn't change prognosis. Even if you have mild, moderate hydramnios, that doesn't change prognosis. But once you have hydrops, that is accumulation of fluid in other places in the body, that is when things you need to worry. Or when you have such large cysts like this, uh, which are uh, filling up the entire lung, again, you know, we, we, we need to keep uh, we need to counsel them about potential uh, potential coming up of an eye drops. So here's an example at uh, 29, 30 weeks. This is last year. Uh, we had a CVR of 1.2, uh, which is a little unusual because by usually by 29, 30 weeks, we start uh, seeing them regressing. So we said, okay, we'll, there was no high drops. So we said, okay, we'll watch. But after one or two weeks, uh, the CVR increased further, uh, reached almost 1.6. So we gave them steroids because very often, uh, with steroids, we can see a reduced reduction in the size of a CPAN. But it continued to increase and before hydrops could set in, uh, we thought we will put a shunt uh, from the cyst to the amniotic fluid. But the patient had come from a long distance and it was difficult to get the shunt immediately. So what we did is we aspirated the larger cysts or the macro cysts and fortunately a good number of them were communicating. So after aspirating two cysts, the size of the lesion actually decreased in front of our eyes and subsequently on followed up on follow up at 36 and 37 weeks the cvr which had gone to 1.6 dropped to 1.2 or even 0.6 so this child was born in thane and uh, subsequently a ct scan was done which showed a small lesion and because the child was little symptomatic they did a surgery and uh, but subsequently the child has done significant uh, very well and is almost i think one year now so we can also put, of course, shunts uh, from large cysts into the amniotic fluid. If you have, you see that eye drops is developing. Very often, if you are doing an intervention procedure, you don't know whether these cysts are communicating or non-communicating. If they're communicating, it's good for us, you know. So uh, what has been suggested is that once you puncture the cyst, you can put some contrast, ultrasound contrast, like definitely or son on you, and then see whether the cysts are communicating. If they're communicating, then our intervention procedures can become. Good. So, if you have large macrosis, then uh, there is an option 
of uh, doing aspiration or putting up uh, shunts. But if you have microcysts or solid lesions, then again, uh, then people have uh, done laser ablations or people have done also percutaneous sclerotherapy. Honestly, I have not done anything in solid lesions so far. What about sequestration? Again, no effusion, very good survival and almost 50% resolved. But a good number of them would require spastectomy after birth. But with effusion, again, the prognosis is bad. So, if there is a pulmonary sequestration with effusion, then it is advised that we drain the fluid or put a shunt from the pleural cavity into the amniotic fluid and burn the feeder vessel with laser or with an RFA. And this is supposed to have a very good effect. And that's uh, I've taken it from one of the journals where they have done a laser for uh, for the feeder vessel. So uh, this, of course, benefits the fetus significantly in those which are who are developing eye drops, and as the lesions is supposed to uh, regress. Now, very, very important message here is that even if you see the lesion regressing in the third trimester, this does not match the actual regression because a good number of these lesions, beca lesions become isoechoic in late pregnancy. It might be difficult for you to pick up and therefore it is very important to investigate after birth. So there are two schools of thought. Some people like to do a CT scan in almost all patients. And in some uh, period, uh, periodic surgeons would like to do it only if the fetus or the, uh, the newborn is symptomatic. So I would say if the newborn is symptomatic, then definitely one should do a, a, a CT scan because you are not going to see it easily on X-ray or uh, you are not going to see it on ultrasound neither after after the baby is born. So another very important thing is that when you counsel, uh, almost about 10% of CPAMs can potentially develop pleuropulmonary blastomas. So this also has to be kept in mind when you do the counseling to the patients. Now, this is of course in CPAMs and not so in sequestration.